Hey everybody, a uh, man who could use a haircut explains spreadsheet. That's what we're doing today. Uh, a few days ago I streamed uh, the creation of 1.8 million tires. Uh, they were created as I was sleeping. And today I'll give you a very detailed look that you haven't asked for what is happening behind the scenes to, uh, to do that. And I figured no longer really actively working on any uh, sim title. And if I was, I could probably not show uh, this stuff. But since I'm just cooking up a few things in my own sim kitchen, I might as well give you a very detailed look at it. Um, you start to think, why isn't he working on any of the sims? All sorts of explanations possible there, including that he doesn't know what he's doing, but we will pretend I know what I'm doing, all right? So um, here we have the idea is uh, provide a minimum amount of parameters and then be very clever, make lots of assumptions, basically. Uh, hopefully not stupid ones, that's what we mean by being clever. And then uh, use these very few parameters to generate smartly-ish <laughs> all the other parameters that we need to make a tire. And do that in such a way that we can make a, a cart tire, a truck tire, slick, threaded, and with so few parameters. And the question is, can you do that? I think you can, because I've made videos about tires before and it might not be for everybody, but in my case, uh, tire data, I've talked about that is quite variable, also quite rare. Uh, so a lot of the time you're left with no data or limited data, yet you have to make a car in a sim uh, handle nicely, which means you have some freedom to decide on the grip levels, load sensitivity, peak slip angles, lots of questions. And wouldn't it be nice if there are some trends that you can think of that make some sense? So instead of doing the wet finger in the air, what is it? <laughs> method to come up with some grip numbers than uh, actually basing it on something. So this is actually a physical tire model in a way. Um, how will I explain this? I don't really know. Let's just look at some of the code. So a lot of the stuff, almost everything here happens in Visual Basic. I've learned to program. Um, I don't really know programming at all, but you can do simple array stuff and, and math maths. I'm also not very good at maths at all, but somehow uh, I pull a few things off. So here we have the code that runs when I click the button. It goes real quick. And now what we have done is create a file. There we are. Here is what we just created by clicking those numbers, uh, clicking the button. So we have slip curves, a 205, 48.6% aspect ratio, R5, R15, 15 inch rim, 100% slickness, and 66.6% softness. So with these input parameters, we have the width, the aspect ratio, the rim. Slickness is just uh, the compound, uh, not sorry, not the compound, whether it's threaded at zero, it's like thick thread blocks and at one it is a full slick and softness is the compound softness so stickiest is one and hardest is zero and i have to give it a rate pressure for the car that i'm making for a few reasons and this is not input this is calculated quickly to check something um, so those are the inputs then after we've given those inputs it, it reads these inputs from the spreadsheet uh, it compiles a name, which we will see in the file. It, that's how it constructs this line that it writes from the visual basic code. And then it does the magic. It calls for a uh, bit of code to run, and then it calls for another bit of code to run, and then it goes to the rear tires and it does the same. So what is this uh, tire make params? That's gonna be the important one. Let's go over that. Where is it? Uh, param call. Here is the code for that. Let's do some shrinkage. Um, so in order to extrapolate so few numbers into so many numbers, uh, how do I go about it? First, I try to calculate a spring rate. 
And why is a spring rate really important, at least the way I approach it in this simplified model, is that the spring rate of the tire is uh, how much it flattens with a certain load and that of course creates your contact patch area. If you have a softer tire with a low spring rate, it will flatten under a load and you'll get a bigger contact patch area than when your tire is pumped up super hard, then it will have a, a higher contact pressure. But it's not as simple as saying that, ah, well, the tire pressure is equal to the contact pressure. That's a myth that might be out there, but it's not true. So how do you decide on how uh, stiff the tire is? Well, there is a formula by the Society of Automotive Engineers. KZ is this one. And that gives you a reasonably good assumption of what a street tire, a road car tire stiffness would be. However, it does not take into account whether it's slick or not. And it doesn't like uh, big pressure changes. And it also doesn't like small tires like go-kart tires or big truck tires. This is a reasonably good starting point for uh, street car tires. And this will be, you know, you have to balance your, your, your model. Do you want to add, it, uh, add complexity? for a little bit more accuracy, or is this rough approach good enough? So if we were to make an arcade game or a simcade game with a bunch of road cars like uh, a Gran Turismo or something, this formula would be fine for calculating the spring rate of the tire. However, we have a few things we'd like to add to that. I want to have this working from go-kart tires to big truck tires, and slicks and fretter tires will be a little different. So I have to scratch the beard and um, think of something more clever. However, I do calculate this first to get a rough idea. So what I do here, um, I create a spring rate for the air and I create a spring rate for the thread. So the, the rubber and the plies and everything and a bit of the sidewall and then I add them together. And how do I uh, go about? Well, the air uh, spring rate is a function of the radius of the tire, the, the width of the tire, and something about the volume of the tire, that's just how much room is inside the tire, and something about the pressure that's in the tire. And I combine all those things uh, in, is, this is just sort of a, let's try this, let's try that, there's no real method into it, other than just keep trying and, and fitting. And then with uh, some nominal values, so the nominal radius is 0.3 meters. And then when it deviates, so the current radius, tire radius, divided by the nominal radius. So if, my, if I have a big truck, truck tire with a radius of 0.6, then the radius factor will be 2. So then the air uh, spring, the radius based spring of uh, for the air will be this. Uh, pressure factor, which is two, sorry, radius factor, which is two, and that gets multiplied. So yeah, it, it, it changes uh, the difference. It looks at the tire that we're making. It changes, what's my nominal tire? Ah, it's different by this much. That means whatever I calculate has to be multiplied by this much. So a truck tire becomes stiffer than uh, a, a, a normal road tire, for example. And I do this by having a power, so the difference to the power of one in this case, so that's linear, and I could do 0.5 for, for non-linearity or, or 1.5 or two, just how, how bigly, <laughs> bigly, oh boy, <laughs> how the difference in radius contributes to a different spring rate. And if this is a power of two, then a growing radius will really quickly add more and more spring rate. So we can fiddle with the knobs where a bigger tire or a smaller tire has a different uh, spring rate. I do that for the radius, the width, the volume and the pressure. And I just went testing and fitting until that came up with a good result. I will show you some of that later. So at the end, we get an air spring rate by combining the, the spring we calculated here for the radius, the width, the volume and the air and magic added a constant. You know, it's not, this is not really physical. This is sort of just thing, figuring out a way to make that fit. So what I also like to do is calculate like a, a rated load for the tire. Uh, tires have a load rating uh, depending on the pressure and 
it's not that important in a way. There is no actual load rating in, in the sim, but it's useful to have like sort of a, uh, this is a reasonable sort of maximum capacity uh, that a tire can take because a few uh, times down the road, we will need a load to uh, set load sensitivity. We will need to input a certain load where we set how much the peak slip angle changes with load. So it is very useful to have a, a rated load for the tire. So each tire has a sort of, ah, this is a maximum load and we can use that later in our other calculations. So for that rated load, um, simple load, I compress, I use that simple formula as a, a guess because we don't know the spring rate yet. So I use this uh, SAE formula and then I figure, well, let's compress the sidewall uh, 10%, just a rule of thumb. And then you can find the load that it takes to uh, compress that sidewall 10%. And I will use that load to con come up with a few other uh, things later, I think it's been a little while. So I will, yeah, that simple load is calculated based on a spring rate that we don't really know yet because we're going to be more in depth than the SAE formula, but for now I'm gonna use that. Then I'll calculate the spring rate for the thread. So that's the rubber blocks and the belts, like it's a centimeter thick and it depends of course on the tire as well. That has a little bit of squishiness in it. So the air that's invisible is a spring and now the, the thread is a spring. So here what I do is first of all, uh, I need something to, to grow with the tire size. I'd like the, these springs to be stiffer the bigger the tire is. Why? I just figured that would fit better and it does work well as I will show later. So I say, well, what's the size? Well, just, just use the radius of the tire. And Sort of the norm is 0.3, the, the reference radius is 0.3. And then again, I calculate the difference. So what is the current size of the tire compared to the norm? And then if it's a truck tire, it's much bigger, that thread spring rate will be higher as well based on the simple size factor. So uh, the contact patch length will now be calculated uh, by what we calculated here with that simple uh, load and the simple comp compressed radius. Here we're using the SAE formula. Um, we will compress, uh, sorry, we don't really use the load, let, load yet. We will compress this uh, tire a certain bit and look at what is the contact patch uh, size. And that is a simple formula here and what we want to know is, okay, of uh, the, the contact patch, what is the threaded and uh, the non-threaded? So we have the slickness of the tire. If it's full slick, then 90% of the contact patch area is considered to be rubber and, and all the materials that's used for the spring rate. If we have a threaded tire, uh, the worst case, then I'm doing like this, say that 45% of the actual contact patch area is in contact with the ground. So there's less material in contact and that load that's pressing on the tire um, will be taken by a smaller area of rubber and that will change its, its spring rate. So the patch area usage then gets calculated. So it's 0.45 for a fully threaded and 0.9 for a full slick, but that slickness is a percentage so in order to calculate that, we do the minimum plus the slickness times the difference. We get a certain uh, percentage of the area uh, that is actually used uh, with, with like rubber and, and material. Then uh, there is a threaded thickness uh, depending, let's see, this has been a little while. Yeah, so if it's really threaded, uh, like thread blocks, they are thicker there will be more material there, more thickness than when it's a slick, which is typically a lot thinner. There's not like one or two centimeters worth of rubber there. It's probably a few millimeters. Whereas the thread blocks on a tire might be a centimeter or one and a half centimeter. That depends. So again, we need to know that thickness because the thicker that rubber is, the more squishy it will be and the more it will soften the tire spring rate because we're still trying to figure out what the tire spring rate is. So here, 
uh, I look at the slickness and come up with a thickness for the thread blocks. And again, this simple size factor that we calculated earlier will make that more or less. So the big truck tire will get an overall thicker uh, profile than a smaller uh, road tire. Then I want to come up with, okay, what is the springiness of that uh, rubber block uh, that is in contact with the ground? And then I figure, well, there is a soft and a hard uh, compound. We have a softness parameter, which is also a percentage. So if it's the softest compound will be more squishy than a super hard compound. So here we have a sort of a spring rate for the rubber of the soft and the hard variant. And what is currently in use depends on that percentage of softness. So here, I, somewhere in between these values, if you have a 50% uh, spring softness, then it will be halfway in between. So that will be uh, 12 times 10 to the fifth. Uh, you know, it will go, uh, find the thread rate. Um, but, and the thread rate will also be, uh, uh, sorry, that's the rate uh, times the area. Um, so why do I do it like that? So we're looking to find the squishiness of the rubber blocks. Well, the more area you have in use, the harder it will be to compress that area like a centimeter. If it's only a minute like little needle or like a, a very small little thread block, then you can squish it with your hands probably for one centimeter. But if it's a big area, it takes a lot more force to compress that one centimeter. So that increases the rate of the thread. I multiply the rate with the area and I divide it by the thickness because the thicker the, the rubber is, the easier it is like a thick mattress is probably softer than a thin mattress that feels like you're sleeping on floorboards. So this way I can come up with a thread rate, the, the spring rate of the rubber based on if it's soft or hard rubber and based on how thick it is and based if it's a slick where all the contact is based, all the surface area is basically in contact or whether it's a threaded tire where some of the, uh, there will be some air and not all uh, surface area is in contact. <laughs> Yes, this is a long video. I just realized this will not be a short one, but and nobody asked for it either. Oh well. Then we have a sidewall. Uh, again, just sort of making something up that, that fits. So I calculate a factor uh, with the aspect ratio, and that's just something that with aspect ratio squared, using the same simple size factor that we calculated earlier, times a constant. Um, then uh, what I also do is uh, go with like a nominal tire load. Uh, why do I do it that way? I've, well, there's probably reasons. What I do is uh, the simple load here is uh, calculated earlier based on that simplified uh, sort of uh, formula from uh, the SAE. Let's carry one that's here. So we have some idea of a reasonable maximum sort of tire load. And again, there's a nominal load, just whatever is reasonable. And then I've, well, what is the current tire do compared to the nominal load? And then based on that difference, I do the load factor to a certain power times a constant. And then the sidewall uh, spring gets, uh, gets ad added together. Um, Aspect, where is it? Yeah, so there's this part, aspect ratio based sidewall spring rate and another factor, uh, which is here. Just some sort of fitting and some yeah, rule of thumb and just adding some things together. This is a little confusing. I, I realized this whole, this whole video will be mostly confusing. And then we can calculate some numbers we will need to use actually in, in the physics file. So. What's, what's all that about? Now we have an air spring rate that we calculated based on a few numbers and a thread spring rate. And what I do, I put them in series. So there are two springs uh, next to each other. And their combined stiffness is what I take. Uh, it's like uh, when you place something in series, you get that a way to calculate this is one divided by uh, one divided by one plus one divided by the other plus one. If there is a third spring, you can add that too. So this is the spring rate in series. And after all that is done, and you can see it depends on quite a few things, but a lot of this is just sort of 
random, fairly random, like mm, let's try this relationship, let's try that relationship, what do we get? And then we get to this, not very uh, pretty, but here we have a bunch of tires with a bunch of different sizes and aspect ratios. And what we can now do is update. So let's see. Um, yeah, there we are. So it com comes up with a certain spring rate. These, this is uh, kilonewtons per meter for a certain tire. And let's just focus on the first three. Let's just magically make these disappear. So here we have three tires. So let's make a small tire, or in fact, let's make the same tire. Ah, can't type. A slickness of one, a softness of... So this is a GT tire-ish. And update now, it will all be the same. So we have a spring rate of 328, uh, which is fair enough. And now to show you how this uh, behaves when we create like a softer compound. So here we, uh, let's take 0 0.5, 0 0.75 and 1. And let's try that again. Here we see that the harder compound, so this is 100% softness, we get 324. And less soft, more harder rubber, actually increases the spring rate just a little bit. And of course we can tweak this by going into the code and changing those constants and those parameters. But this is something that the SAE formula doesn't have. So the spring rate of the tire here will change based on uh, the slickness of the tire and also the softness. Softness doesn't have a big effect as you can see. That is just something I guessed. I don't have a lot of data for it, but it makes sense that it would be different. But let's see what happens if we make it like fully threaded uh, 50% threaded and slick. And then I calculate again. I think we'll see a different difference that's bigger. So here uh, with thread blocks, we are significantly softer with the tire than when it's a full slick. Uh, so here the effect is bigger because uh, the thread blocks are thicker, which means they're softer. And instead of a slick, there's lots of unused area in the contact patch where it's just, you know, there's no thread there. There are like grooves in there and air is not very stiff. So that's why in this case, the threaded tire has softer spring rate than uh, the slick tire. And that plays a bigger role in my model anyway, than the softness of the compound uh, is, is less important than whether it's threaded or slick. So, that's what, what we come up with. And the neat thing is, uh, do I know what a, a karting tire, uh, five slickness, that's fine, normal pressure, about one bar. So this is a front tire for go-kart. And we get 108, which is pretty much what a uh, car tire will be. And what about a truck tire? What are they? Uh, 0 0.285, 0 0.75, 22 and a half. It's about, nah, it's not slickness, it's pretty hard. And the nominal pressure might be seven bar. Uh, and then we try again. Ooh, out of range, what have, have I broken? Ah, I've broken something. Why have I broken something? Oh boy. Uh, this happens a lot. You, you can sort of count on that <laughs> when you do this stuff. Um, mm, it's not much wrong with the data entry. I was tweaking some things and probably slickness is good. Softness, let's make it zero. See if we can get this to work. Ah, there we are. Well, Code result will always have its issues, right? Uh, anyway, now uh, what we see here, the spring rate is 851, which is right in line with a uh, Michelin big truck tire. So this way of creating the spring rate, which is really important later as well, works very well for uh, big tires, small tires, slicks, threaded, 
soft compound, hard compound, everything will be unique. Everything is actually based on spring rates and service area. So it's physical in a way, although it's sort of a fudge to get reasonable numbers. But it's highly important uh, for, for, for later and it does a pretty good job. Uh, let's make a couple more like what is a, a small single seater tire. What is that point? 55 13 inch so it's slick and it's fairly soft and the operating pressure is one and a half bar Let's see we got a hundred and something So here we get a spring rate of 193 and if we go with like an old-school f1 rear tire same idea, I would expect this to be 250, 270. So that's 274, that's really quite in line with what you would expect. So it comes up with pretty good numbers for the spring rate and I don't have to think about it. And you can get, make mistakes. And I recently sort of did that, being very used to Formula 2 and GT tires. I had to make a tire for a small, uh, smaller car and I gave the tires a bit too much grip because I was my mind was still thinking about GT cars, not realizing how actually how small the tires were that, were that I was making, and this actually did better than I would have done myself. So everybody in a state of utter confusion. Um, we've done. The spring rate and then the code goes on here i just come up with that load rating for the tire i've mentioned that before i also calculate the damping rate of the tire which is a function of the spring rate it's really simple uh, you might be able to do something a little more clever uh, based on a few more things but that's the thing you can always expand and now the tire damping factor is just a function of its spring rate um, i come up with a load rating i mentioned it before and i do that by uh, compressing the radius a percentage and the sidewall a percentage and then sort of blending you know what do i want to use and then the com actual compression so i will flatten the tire to a certain amount uh, and then we'll see what what load it takes to flatten that tire uh, like 10 percent of its of its sidewall height if we flatten it by that much uh, what's the load needed to flatten the tire and that becomes the rated load which is fairly logical uh, we can see it here as well i think yeah rated load uh, so the, this is again really functional and simple but it does work very well because the rated load for the car tire is a, just over 100 kilos which is fair the rated load for like the f1 rear tire is slick is over 700 kilos it will see higher loads but it's it's a reasonable number and the rated load for the truck tire at just over three tons is really close to sort of the rated load of a, of a truck tire so it's not a random number it actually matches reasonably well and if you do it for street tires let's just make a uh, what's the common street tire 5.5 17 it's not slick it's not soft and the nominal pressure is 2.2 bar something like that so this is a, a pretty high load actually but it's also a really big tire uh, the radius uh, is, is quite large so we get a rated load of about 800 kilos and that is fair enough and then if you look at my old uh, 14 my old fiesta would get a rated load of 500 kilos and a, a softer spring rate. It all works uh, works quite well. Having found the sort of the rated load and, and the stiffness of the tire, here is it where it gets interesting. I have to set load sensitivity. And that means, what is load sensitivity? Well, we see it here. Let's actually plot a normal tire instead of this truck tire. Um, let's make a range actually of some semi slicks. Uh, let's make this an 18 inch, uh, 16 inch. Uh, let's make it 50 smaller. Something like that, 16, uh, 15 inch. 
14 and 16 is whatever. Slickness 0.5.5.5, softness 0.1.1.1, 2.2 bar for each sort of a street tire update. You will see these curves change quite a bit. And what happens here is, which are we plotting? A load sensitivity, so that's the grip here on the vertical axis versus the load on the horizontal axis drops. And let's say we make a tire uh, softer. Am I plotting this one? I'm not plotting that, I am plotting that one. So a much softer tire will create more grip at low loads, it will drop steeper. And these, this is a very important part of, uh, of a racing tire and of road tires. They don't like load, they increase the total grip typically, but the uh, friction coefficient drops. And the way I calculate that is by having a, uh, we know the contact patch area. So we know the pressure that's on the contact patch. And for that, I have like a curve where we have uh, on one side the friction coefficient and on the other axis we have the contact patch pressure and well that's it, it will be a linear curve so uh, we brush brush i haven't used this often Rawr. Uh, like that. So yeah, there and there, uh, and we get a linear line. Uh, so here is the pressure on the contact patch, and this is the grip friction coefficient. So this is a curve that I enter, and I have two curves. So one is for the hardest, and one is for the softest, because that my idea is that a hard compound takes load better with less consequences than a soft compound. Uh, this is actually wrong. <laughs> uh, it's just, so soft compound, hard compound, something like that. So the soft compound has a lot more grip initially at low pressures, but the more pressure you put on the tire, uh, on the contact patch, the more it drops. And the hard compound has a lot less grip, but is also less affected by load. So these are sort of the two curves that I enter, and that is simply done by having a slope, a minimum and a maximum for grip, and a minimum and a maximum for slope. So you get two lines, and I interpolate there between uh, these two lines based on the softness of the compound. So you get an infinite number of curves somewhere in between these two, uh, giving us the relationship between tire contact patch, patch pressure and how much grip we have. And what happens now in the code, I'm looking at, all right, let's look three loads, a low load, which is 10% of that tire rated load. We just calculated 60% and 100%. Look at what the contact patch pressure is. And this is a formula uh, and, uh, that I made, a tire function, tire load sense patch pressure, which is here somewhere. Tire load sense patch pressure. So this is a separate function that takes a radius with spring rate load uh, and it looks at that slope and the initial uh, grip. So it, it looks at whatever we came up with uh, for these two curves, the in-between probably. It all goes in and the usage, uh, the area percentage of uh, area that we use from the contact patch, uh, it does a few Calculation, so what is at these three loads, low, medium, and high load, what is actually with this tire, with this dimension, and with this complicatedly calculated spring rate, what is the contact patch area? And when you know the area, you can come up with the, the, the pressure that's on the contact patch for that tire with that load. And then we, when you know that, you can look that up in your curve. So let's say we have, a, we have an in-between tire that's a, not the softest and not the stiffest. So it's going to be like this. And at low load, uh, we have, this is the pressure. So we might be here at medium load. We might be 
here and at high load we might be there. So we know that this tire at those three loads we expect at low load to have this friction coefficient, at medium loads we expect to be here and at high loads we expect to be here. And that's what we want to achieve. Problem is uh, the AMS load sensitivity does not work that way. It uses, uses a different formula. So now uh, in order to do this I know what I want, right? That's what we just seen. Those three points is what I want. And then I set up an iteration here uh, to try and get to match these three points with the code that is actually running in Automobilista. And what I do is I have a reasonable idea of what numbers I have to use and then I check the error at all these three loads. So I get have some starting values and my first run might be this and then okay it optim it sees an error here and here and here and then all right let's do another run it will be there it's not quite right another run there oh that's not quite right it keeps adjusting until the lines overlay and we have exactly the same three points at each of these three loads we get the same friction coefficient by curve fitting uh, the desired load sensitivity onto the whatever the model is that is in ams very complicated and annoying way. You know, if you would do it this way, you would probably just program the load sensitivity differently. Uh, so it would give you that contact patch area based uh, grip, but it's not available to us, so can't do it. So we do that for lateral and longitudinal behavior. And then let's create a few slicks. Uh, uh, like that. And here we have three lines. So these are tires that are sort of separated in size quite linearly. So the red line, this is the, the lateral load sensitivity of the big tire. And then we go a step narrower and with, with not fudging, but actually looking at the contact patch area and the pressure and with the same sort of the rubber compound uh, friction curves, we get this green curve for the middle tire because it's got less contact patch area. It will be uh, suffering a little bit more from load than the bigger tire and the same for the smaller one. So that's how we get load sensitivity curves physically based on the uh, contact patch area and on some master grip curves for soft and a hard compound inter interpolating between them, looking at free loads from this is my target and then curve fitting the AMS uh, load sensitivity code to fit at those free loads. And then we get these results. And like I said, I went down the wrong path a little bit with uh, a small uh, closed cockpit car that I'm making for somebody. Uh, where the tires were too grippy because I was too used to uh, looking at like GT tires, a bit like this one here. Whereas my tire was more like this. There we go. You see now this smaller tire really has a much worse sort of load sensitivity because it's got a lot less surface area to take all that load than the big tire. So it's really logical the way it does it and uh, really helpful. So that's a very complicated way to uh, come up with a load sensitivity and load sensitivity is usually important. I do the same uh, laterally and longitudinal. So laterally is cornering grip, load sensitivity and longitudinal. If it's different, some say it is, some say who knows. Um, and I'm always trying different things and I, I don't know. But at least it is based on logic and physical properties of the tire and we do it there so that's one thing and then there's also pressure which is modeled in a certain way that makes uh, for each load there is an optimal tire pressure so that kind of makes sense although with radial tires i'm not exactly sure typically you would probably possibly expect a lower pressure to give more grip but you get into other problems like overheating or simply destruction of the tire. But anyway, the way it works in AMS is not silly. I don't think there's an optimum pressure for uh, each load 
And here I set some values for that uh, based on uh, like what is uh, at what load uh, is this rated pressure. So we imp input here 1.8 bar, um, 1.8 bar. Okay, at, at what load is that your optimum pressure? And I say, well, that's 60% of my uh, rated load. And the rated load is what we calculated earlier and it matched quite well. So that's the point where, okay, 1.8 bar, then you have optimal pressure at 60% of the rated load. So rated load is 5,500, so 60% of that, 1.8 bar maximum grip. Is your tire load different or your pressure different? You will have a different optimal uh, grip situation. So you're at lower loads, you need lower pressure to generate the most grip. So there is like a, a peak and then higher load you get lo less grip and lower load you have less grip and you, you that, that curve if you have a higher pressure you move it to the right so for higher loads you have optimal grip and if you have lower pressure you move that curve the other way and then at low loads you have optimal grip and then higher loads you lose and even lower loads you, lo you lose so this is all based on the same on, on like the tire logic we made earlier but it's a sort of a fudge because it, data for this is really hard to find and how sensitive is it? It's a bit of a question mark, but at least it's applied very logically. Same for uh, speed sensitivity. Uh, does speed influence grip loss? Perhaps uh, some tires spinning at like uh, 200 miles an hour will uh, deform or create issues. Yeah, it's very hard to find data for. You can find it for like truck tires race and road tires mm, it's not as obvious and it's probably not a huge effect but i still want to do something reasonably logical because uh, the smaller the tire is the smaller the radius the more it will have to sort of work hard and spin fast in order to go 200 miles an hour so here i'm deciding to well how much grip are we going to lose with speed I don't know, but at least make it a function of the radius of the tire. So the smaller the tire is, the quicker it will spin because this factor is about absolute like car speed. Uh, so wh at what car speed do we lose 50% of tire grip? So car speed is one thing. I want to look at the rotational speed of the tire because I think, I don't know, that a tire spinning at 6000 RPM will have more trouble keeping its contact patch intact than a tire that spins at 1000 RPM. So I, I made the grip loss as a function of speed, a function of the radius. And the same for the growth of the tire uh, with speed, like a dragster tire that expands. It's really simple. It's very hard to, you know, you find some data for it, but is it the most important? That really depends. But I also make it a function of the tire radius uh, and here it's actually based on the RPM of the tire already. So the grip loss is a factor of vehicle speed. Don't ask me why, it's just a choice made by ISI in 2005. And the growth of the tire is a function of its rotational velocity. So I don't really have to look at things that much, but I still make it based on the radius because if we tell a tire to grow one centimeter at 200 miles an hour, um, it's then you make like a scale model or a racing con a radio control tire that is only one centimeter. Then if, if we add one centimeter to that, that would be like a hundred percent increase. And if we do it on the truck tire, which is huge, one centimeter is nothing. So I still decided to make it a function of the tire radius to at least have something logical. Then the pneumatic trail, which is very important for force feedback. It's hard to tell really, but well, I find the tire compression by looking at that rated load again, and by defining that by the total tire spring rate, we find the compression. And what I work out here is what I've done elsewhere as well, is the length of the contact patch. Because that's the trail will be some percentage of the length of the contact patch. And that's what I found to here. So my pneumatic trail will be 15% of the total length of the contact patch. I read that somewhere that might be reasonable, don't really know. But again, the most important thing here is that it doesn't matter what tire we're making, the contact patch length will be quite accurate because we found a pretty good uh, tire spring rate and that will set the flattening and the contact patch length. So by choosing a percentage of the contact patch length, we'll have a super consistent pneumatic trail for all tires. 
Next up is rolling resistance, uh, which is set. You know, again, we don't really know that much, but probably a sticky tire will, a grippy tire will have a bit more uh, rolling resistance. Here it's again, it's based on the radius, the width, the softness, um, and a base value. So we just add the base value plus the, plus the radius value and the width value, and we add those up. And the softer the tire is, the more rolling resistance it will have. The wider the tire is, the more rolling resistance it will have. The bigger the radius is, the less rolling resistance it will have, and we have a base value. It's simple, because is it usually important for racing type? Mm, it's a fairly small percentage compared to all the other forces involved. But still, it computes a rolling resistance that's logical. So a, a slick tire will have a bit more rolling resistance than a fretted tire, a uh, harder tire and a wider tire will have a bit more rolling resistance. It's really nice and logical. And this is also one of those things where typically you sort of, yeah, you guess a number. And often by doing that, you're worse off than actually calculating it logically like this. And don't, don't have to think about it. Uh, do I have numbers here? Yeah. So here we see the results of those three tires. The rolling resistance of this uh, sort of bigger tire is one and a half percent bigger wider tire and the narrow tire is 1.2 percent and we can see now if we make it softer let's create the same tire uh, two bar let's say and one is 0 0.5 and one so now let's see what the difference is between rolling resistance Quite a bit, right? So here, uh, the, the harder tire, zero softness, has 1.2%, and the softest tire has 1.6% rolling resistance. A logical difference based on the, the stickiness of the compound. It's neat to do it that way, and these results are probably as good as you're going to get for most cases. The point here is that, yes, sometimes you do get reliable data, but I mentioned a lot of the time you don't, and then you need to come up with reasonable numbers and sometimes you guess them and perhaps you're not having a great day and you're guessing them wrong and calculating them this way is, is at least very logical. Another important aspect is uh, the, the peak slip angle, which is, it can be anything, right? So there isn't really uh, that much of a trend, but here I'm sort of forcing myself to find a trend, what the peak slip angle could be for a tire. And that's the same method as we've seen before. So I have sort of a base and I change the peak slip angle, gets smaller if the tire is wider. The peak slip angle grows if the aspect ratio, the sidewall is, is, hot, is more. And if the tire is a full slick, it reduces the peak slip angle because there are no thread blocks to twist and add extra, extra slip angle, perhaps a good idea. But if the tire is really soft, uh, it might have a bit more stretchy rubber, so that will increase the slip uh, angle a little bit. And here we add some factors to that, and we look at the difference, or we look at the tire uh, base peak plus the width times the width plus the aspect times the aspect, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so at the end, you get a slip angle that's a function of these parameters. And if we look at our three tires that are currently the same, you can see that the low load optimum slip angle is slightly different, 5.6, 5.8, 5.9, because the difference here is the softness. So the softer tire has a slightly higher peak slip angle because we expect perhaps, at least it's logical, it doesn't know if it's true, I don't know, but the soft rubber to flex a little bit more and to stretch a little bit more and perhaps give us a slightly increased peak slip angle. What happens then if we go from, uh, we make the softness the same, but I, I actually don't know what's going to happen. We make it zero slickness, 0.5 slickness, and one slickness. Does that change? I think, I hope it will, because when it's not as slick, you have those thread blocks, and I think they will flex more. So I would expect more than a 0 0.3 degree difference to occur now, but I don't know. Oh, look, yeah. So it's quite a big difference. Here the fully threaded, like big thread block tire has a peak slip angle at low loads of almost seven degrees. Whereas uh, 
A slick tire is a degree less because it doesn't have those stretchy, flexy thread blocks. So that's really a very sort of physical almost way to look at what the peak slip angle might be. There's a lot of variation in this in real life. I'm sure that the construction you, you give a tire, sure, sure, sure. And if you have reliable data, definitely I would use that. But this is a scenario for, let's say we have Assetto Corsa, even AMS or Gran Turismo. Uh, and somebody says, Niels, we have 145 cars and I'd like to have the tires next week. You cannot find specs for all these tires. So you would have to construct a logical formula that uh, predicts the parameters. So super useful and the, the, the numbers that come out are sort of yeah within the ballpark of what I would use anyway, but now I no longer have to think about it because the thinking is done here in the spreadsheet. Well, that also gives us an idea for uh, peaks for longitudinal, uh, which is a little tricky, but let's not go into that now. This video is gonna be so long and boring that nobody's gonna watch. Uh, camber. What is camber? Uh, what's the optimum camber? You, you see the sort of a pattern here. I always tend to look at it very simply at first. So, well, that's a base sort of a, a grip gain from camber. Well, 5%. And then, well, what if my aspect ratio, if my sidewall is taller, I think it will sort of cope with more negative camber better. It will be able to, to come to you know, be more compliant than a very thin sidewall tire. Do I know that? Not really, but it, it's one way to go about it. So the aspect ratio, um, if it is bigger, so if we have taller sidewalls, uh, I want to add a little bit of extra uh, camber gain, more grip gained. And if it's wider, uh, I think I subtract, but here is positive value. So we might as well, yeah, we divide that. So the the wider the tire is, and then we add camber, then the more sort of that contact patch is no longer, is off the ground with a lot of negative camber, or it's not making good contact. So the wider the tire is, the more the camber grip gain is reduced. And then we have some base values, and then we just simply do the base plus the width of that, 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 that. and then we add those up, we come up with a camber gain. And we can make it as complicated as you want. There's not a lot of data out there. We can see that the camber gain for these three tires is identical because apparently in the camber gain, I do not yet look at the slickness of the tire. That's probably wrong. You know that that thread blocks versus a slick tire, they might compress more or less and perhaps it changes the behavior of the tire and the camber. So it's currently not taken into account. But if we change these tires a little bit, make it a little wider, for example, the rest is the same. Here we can see that the camber gain changes quite a bit. So the narrower tire, which I think is sort of in better contact with the road at negative camber because it's, well, if it's a super narrow tire, then it's effectively only has one contact point and then camber doesn't really do anything. But if it's a wider tire, then a lot of the tire is no longer in good contact. So that's my approach here. And the narrow tire, 225 wide, has 16.5% camber gain, where the wide tire has 13% camber gain. At the same time, the loss, longitudinal uh, traction loss from camber is also worse. The wider the tire is, the more uh, you lose traction from uh, when braking and accelerating because the tire isn't flat on the ground, but at an angle. So all really uh, logical. True or not, I never know, but it's logical and it makes sense and it comes up with in my view, sensible numbers. And there I do some heating and cooling. Um, I don't think I'll go into that too much, but here it really helps knowing how the SIM actually has the equations for heating. And I can then do the same as with all the other parameters, come up with, okay, what is the size of this tire? How does the heating work in the SIM or how do the equations work? So can I set heating parameters that makes sense for this tiny tire that are re really lowly loaded like a go-kart tire. And then we go to a big slick on a GT car, have heating uh, values that when you put that tire on a suitable car, you will get reasonable uh, amounts of heating. So when you slide into a corner uh, and you've got a correctly matched tire and car, 
you will perhaps go from 40 degrees to 80 degrees on, on the tire, for example. But if you would put a go-kart tire on a big GT car and you would do the same, you would go from 100 degrees to 400 degrees because that tiny tire will not cope with all the energy that you're putting in with the big GT car sliding it in through into a corner. So what's really neat here is knowing these equations in the game, we can actually have sort of a target heat that we want to have based on the size of the tire. And that means we no, no longer have to tweak. I'm sure we will actually, because this is all this is very cool, but not super tested yet. But here you have formulas that will decide for all the tires, how they heat up rolling and how they heat up from friction. And it's all based on the parameters of the tire size and on the code in the game. So ultimately, when these numbers work and you pick the correct tire for the correct car, which is of course a part of real uh, engineering as well, you don't put a go-kart tire on a GT car. When that matches, you should see reasonable temperatures uh, from rolling and friction and that should all match. And that's something you no longer have to mess with. Plus actually it could be better to do it this way rather than the other way around. Normally you, we, we make a car in AMS, you drive, oh the tire is getting too hot subjectively, let's change the heating. And here when you do it this way and it's all very logical, you simply trust whatever it comes up with. And then if the tire is too hot uh, on the car, Perhaps it's a matter of looking at the data and perhaps you will find that, oh wait, it's not a 255 tire. I've looked at the data, it's actually a 275 tire. And then I'll make a 275 wide tire, which has more surface area. And I'll try, try to drive again and we'll see less tire heat because we have a bigger tire that's more able to deal with the energy. So that's a really cool idea. And this is, well, it will need some testing. Then uh, another thing, I think it's one of the last things. How long? Almost an hour, jeez. Thank God for uh, 2x uh, playback speed or Alt F4 for some people. Curves. So usually important to the tire model, uh, as I talked about in previous videos, is slip curves. So here we have a, uh, this curve that goes up, reaches an optimal and goes down a little bit. And we have to somehow figure out, okay, we have a tire with all the properties and now I have to assign a slip curve to it and do a, a f quite a few things. So what I have is here the initial shape and this is not programmed, it's just sort of a lookup table with extremes. So I have a stiffness value, which stands the initial steepness. See now it's really steep. And now it's not steep, so that's my stiffness and the roundness. So at zero it's straight and then flattens off and at one it tries to sort of round off uh, as, as much as it can. And you can make all sorts of combinations here with uh, super round and stiff. So it's almost a half a circle, a quarter circle. So this is the initial part of the slip curve is done by in interpolation of all these curves. Uh, I haven't found a way to do that nicely mathematically, so it's just interpolation based on a few parameters I've entered. Still, you could, but I don't do it at this moment. What is the difference between a threaded tire or a slick tire? Does it change the shape of this curve? Currently, I don't because I simply don't have any data that might indicate it, but perhaps I'm just you know thinking of something that could be a relationship. Um, so this might be a narrow tire and perhaps a wider tire has more of the contact part patch sliding sooner. So perhaps it's this for a wider tire and this for a narrower tire. It might be true. And like I've shown you before, we could make some parameters that, ah, well, if the tire is this wide, use this stiffness. If it's that wide, use the other stiffness or roundness. So we could add parameters in the code that change these stiffnesses based on actual properties. Here I just choose them for now. But it's nice to see that you could expand it. Here I talk about stiffies. <coughs> the needed stiffy. This is some uh, compensation that I have to do, but it uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, so that's how the build-up curves are made. Currently just 
not depending on the tire properties because remember this is not this is not scaled right we set the peak slip angles earlier and these will be stretched all the time based on the load and the optimal uh, slip angle and stuff like that so it, this is not a fixed curve it will always be stretched and shrunken uh, however drop off is a parameter that we will change and this is a way that let's zoom out a little bit Currently there's quite a bit of drop here. This goes lower to some extent. And we can change that. If we do it like that. Oh, let's uh oh it doesn't update the noise sadly. There we are. So now we have no drop off and then I hope it works 0.5. Yeah, I had to do it twice. So this is a lot of drop off, right? This shape is not a lookup table. It's a function of a sine wave. And here I will change it based on the tire properties. So is the sine wave in here somewhere? Effectively what I do is I have a, a, a sine wave. Uh, let's bring up paint again. So a sine wave like, like that. And what I do is I can uh, stretch the X axis and also stretch the Y axis. So if we stretch that, you can get something like this or something like, like that. So that's how I compute the drop-off. And of course, this amount of drop-off is also a function. So I stretch the sine function here, cosine function, which looks really complicated, but it was just a matter of messing about until it worked based on uh, how much I want to stretch these curves. And I do assign some of these properties to the, the tires based on their uh, slickness and stuff like that. Um, let's see, yeah. So I come up with a suddenness of drop off. So here it drops off really sudden and here it's more gradual and here it's way later that it drops off. So I look at a few parameters that, well, perhaps a softer compound because our tire heating isn't perfect that the more you're sliding, the bigger your slip angle is Perhaps you will uh, generate extra heat and would expect a little bit more drop off. So the softer the tire in these simplified equations, the more the curve will look like this. And the harder the tire, the more it will look like that. It will cope better with sliding without losing too much grip. So again, that is based on the actual softness of the compound. And it will look at that. What is my current softness? And based on the softness, it will set the, the, the drop off uh, suddenness, the shape, and also the amount. So uh, it could, for example, be that, let's try to do it to scale. So a soft tire, let's do it really exaggerated, uh, would, oh, grip, yeah, oh, you lose a lot, oh my god, like that. And then a harder compound tire. Uh, might be ah you're fine you know it's not really much going on so it drops a lot less and it drops more gradual and that's what i compute and how i change that cosine uh, scaling to come up with the drop off shape drop off shape so each tire with each uh, different compound setting will get a unique sh shaped uh, curve that is based on logic in the code so and I do a lot more. I I add noise and stuff to it if if that's desired. You know, is it yeah? Is it? You see here, noisy. It's it's fun to experiment with. It's it's an it's an option. And by the way, when I click update graphs, all this is forty thousand runs of tire code. And what is running in the background? Can I actually show that? Let's go off screen. Well, a little bit. All right, so here, tire code. This is effectively, it's not a direct copy, but it is more or less the, 
actual tire physics that are in AMS. So this is the actual tire model where it looks, okay, what is my input? All these numbers that I'm generating, uh, this is actually what we what comes out of all these, uh, the, the things I talked about, how we program, uh, all these effects that come from just a few parameters. Ultimately, what comes out is all this and these complex curve shapes. Oh, Tommy says hungry. So we run the actual uh, AMS physics here in, in VBA 40,000 times in 0.4 seconds. VBA is so much quicker than I ever thought it would be. So easy to make a spreadsheet sluggish. But what I do is instead of plotting the curves here with from data, I plot the charge directly from a uh, VBA array that goes way, way quicker. But anyway, uh, with this tire running, the code running, I can actually check the properties and, and see what happens there. Is there anything else? Well, I think there's one final little, mm, nah, it's fine. You, you, get, you get the idea now, right? So that's what's happening. And um, simple input parameters, but quite a lot going on behind the scenes to come up with all the other parameters that are at least logical that makes sense to me, uh, but always in the back of my mind, sure, well, tire data is rare, tires can be constructed in a million ways, so this is by no means the one truth, but it is a way to come up with a logical and functional tire based on how small it is, big it is, and it will work very well, and it will make tires that are just as good and probably more consistent. That's actually the benefit of this. You're no longer uh, up to whatever you you guessed on that day when you were making the Formula One car, and then two years later you're making a, another Formula One car. You forgot what you guessed two years ago. You do something else, and it might be inconsistent and not really desirable. Whereas a system like this, uh, the modern sort of formulas and equations try to make sense of the few input parameters, and you get a very consistent logical output. Plus, if you tweak this at some point, like we we saw that. Uh, what was it, the camber gain did not depend on the slickness of the tire. Well, you could think, mm, you know, I'd like to have a subtle effect there as well. And you can add that to your VBA code. And then when you save the tires, all the tires could be saved of the entire game. And they now will have a slightly different camber gain based on their uh, being a slick or a fretted tire. So you wouldn't have to update all the tires one by one. You would just do that sort of from the mothership here, so to speak. So you can keep updating your uh, tools and make better tires uh, as time goes on without having to sort of manually tweak anything. You just think long about the underlying code or you have some new data for load sensitivity. You can uh, roll it out, tire pun intended, uh, globally, which is super useful. The final thing we have to look at is then, all right, you've come up with all these parameters, but how do you make a file? And that's a bit of Excel neatness. Um, so, uh, where are we? Um, effectively, what we're looking at here is an array for the front tire, tire TBC is tire, and this code increments the position in the array, and I put a string of data in there which is a combination of text and calculated numbers. So here uh, it will, in the fourth line of the file, it will write step is, and then it look at let step, which is the lateral slip angle step that we calculated logically uh, in the parameters earlier. So here we combine text with calculated numbers and we go on and on and on, insert the curve on and on and on. Here we create all the parameters for the tire and that's eventually uh, saved. Let's see, make F, oh, I think it's just, uh, make front, make rear. These are two separate arrays. And the annoying thing is uh, the tire file has to be in a certain, certain order. So we have an array for the front tire, array for the rear tire, and then we combine them by taking a bit from the front, putting it in the main file, taking a bit from the rear, putting it underneath. Uh, so the file is the correct order. 
uh, with offsets and then we just fill the new array with the old array in the right position uh, file name and then this is need code that saves the file so here we have those uh, attire with the results being a curve that's many 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 points is this needed no but if i want to play with noisy curves you have to have a very high res curve and then we have another curve you see front and rear lateral acceleration and braking curves goes on and on and on and here we have the parameters so the front all the parameters and the rear all the parameters and this is saved directly to a file and this is what i did last week 1.8 million tires about 80 tires per second generated in in this way um, so yeah i think that's over an hour uh, of explaining how uh, this works and my reasoning behind it and to to sum up really i think it is a trap that you can easily fall into uh, not if you're doing uh, acc where you effectively have like a few different tires only but imagine doing ac ams or uh, what, what is another game race room lots of cars making all these tires one by one over various years and at some point what you did a few years ago is probably no longer how you would do it today and then you have all these car physics files that you have to keep up to date manually and my proposal is if you have a really sort of simple and this is just one way to do it we might add a few more parameters if we see the need to do it this is really sort of a minimal sort of set of parameters that goes in which i think is important you don't want to have unnecessarily uh, many parameters but instead of doing it manually per car we just have clever rules that i just explained that will magically cleverly come up with whatever tire you're making and it will not make bad assumptions it will all be very logical and if you make improvements to your code you can roll it out that's the tire pun again over your entire fleet of, of cars at the same time and beta test it and see oh that now the road tires are a bit too much this and the slick tires are a bit too much that you can test it over a wide range of cars and roll out uh yeah sort of a fleet-wide upgrade to all the cars in the sim and i think the consistency is super important in the sim and this will benefit greatly by doing it this way and that's why also i think uh, you need the tire model to be complicated but not more complicated than it has to be and i've made videos before about ams tire model it has areas that i'd like to improve but it's not too it's pretty good actually and it's seen as old and simple but i've also shown you that it can do a lot of things uh, quite well and if you think about it this way with this method this will not apply to a physical tire model it's probably too well perhaps you can but it's going to be really difficult and you know that's what is the best result is it the, just a model or is it a finding a way to work with the model especially with 100 cars in a game and i think pretty soon you know uh, overconfidence can get hold of people and they think oh yeah i can juggle these million balls at the same time with all the parameters but it gets very tricky very soon and this way you'll be uh, on top of of your tire generation um, that's uh, the video nobody asked for um, and you know a, li a little bit of a look in the kitchen of how i would do it if i was developing a new uh, a new game uh, i do this just for fun and i do learn from it and you know at some point who knows we'll get involved in a sim of uh, one of another and the more cars it has the more it will benefit from methods like this and i will do exactly the same with uh, aero maps suspension setup uh, overall properties a uh, simple way to make engines and stuff like that i really see a great joy that's the main thing that drives me the, the joy of coming up with these magic things and hopefully the output is good but it's very enjoyable to take a little bit and turn it into a lot and doing that on all fronts would make it possible to generate sim quality cars and tire cars with, with uh, geometry, aero, all the stuff and tires relatively simply. And then you have like complete control over your entire car set in your game, no matter if it's 50 cars or 100 cars or 200 cars, you can keep them up to date, roll out new physics updates. 
it will be magical in my mind and then you actually do it and you surely come across a whole bunch of issues and problems but since it's a bit of a hobby now i just pretend it will be perfect but i do see great promise in it so guys i hope well i'm talking to nobody am i that some of you probably uh, uh yeah insomnia was cured someone must have fallen asleep i was in stereo today um and if you have any questions do post them below and i probably forgot something or talked gibberish so uh i better stop bye bye